Abraham, beginning at verse number one. Very familiar portion of scripture this morning. Matter of fact, the, probably most that are here could quote at least half of it. Right? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were setting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. It sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Pythagra, Pamphylia, Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in, in our tongue the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be it known unto you, and hearken unto my words. Now I'm not going to read the, the, the uh, message that he preached. You know what that message was as well as I do. And we will mention some of it in my remarks here today. But I want to minister on the subject this morning. The early church spread very quickly. What's wrong today? Yeah, I said the early church spread very quickly. What's wrong today? Help us, Lord Jesus, this morning. We give you praise and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I do believe that the message that we have and the God that we serve and the great commission that was given, that it was meant for this gospel to reach all ends of the earth. And it still needs to be done and needs to be happening. And we know and hear of some things happening on the missions field, but it needs to be happening here at home as well. So to begin my message this morning, uh, what is it that appeals to people or to mankind in general? And the other night when I was in Fredericton returning home, I didn't have my page or radio with me, but I seen lots of lights flashing and I knew something was wrong. And I actually stopped because they may have needed some help. And there was a motor vehicle accident. I'll tell you, flashing red lights not only attract those that are at the fire department, there's a lot of rubberneckers around. What do I mean by rubberneckers? People that happen to drive by, they want to know what's going on. You say amen if you want to, or you don't have to. It's the truth anyway. Right? These are things that appeal to man. You know, flashing red lights, follow a fire truck that's got a siren going. You're not even a fireman, but you got to know where it is and what's happening. True? Yeah. Well, if it's not a motor vehicle accident or fire, oh, what about the drag races? Oh, people like to see a display of horsepower. Who's got the best truck or the best car? Well, who's got the best horse? I'm going to... Pull a little horsepower. Power is appealing to man. Or promotions. All has to do with power. Now, what about a good fight? Oh, man, people gather around. They want to see, may the best man win. Or a woman, if it happens to be a lady, he <laughs> fighting. They fight dirty, by the way. All right. <laughs> Something else that's appealing to man is gossip. Oh, fresh piece of news. Something that really damaged my neighbor. Oh, man, I'm ever glad I got a hold of that. I'm talking about things that appeal to man. Oh, my. I'd like to 
shift the focus off of those natural things today and put it on some spiritual things. Because spiritual things are what's going to matter for eternity, isn't it? All the rest is going to pass away. So I, I've got a four-part message here that I'd like to preach this morning. I want to talk about a faith that produces obedience. Secondly, I want to talk about a passion that calls for unity. Thirdly, this morning, I want to talk about a desperation that will take us to prayer. Fourthly, I want to talk about a spirit that will produce power. Amen. If we got these four things, I'll tell you, we can have Pentecost afresh. All right. So let's talk about the special power of force that appealed to folks in the early church. It was that supernatural power. It was like wildfire in the way that it spread. Now, there are a few reasons why fire stops spreading. Do you ever consider that? I mean, that's why you have a local fire department. Fire starts, they want to put it out. Well, spiritually speaking, when the uh, Holy Ghost fire starts, I don't want anybody to put that out. <laughs> All right? It needs to go and go and go. But there are a few reasons why a fire stops spreading. Number one, you got somebody working against it trying to put it out. Stop a fire. Number two, it runs out of fuel. What do you mean? It's burnt everything it can burn. No more to burn. It quits. It goes out. Number three, lack of oxygen. Now, that's one of the tactics that firefighters actually use. They try to smother the fire. They do it by taking away the oxygen so that they can put it out. Or there's no wind to drive it. Now, if there's a big enough fire, it will create its own wind. Because it's heat, the atmosphere is cool, heat and cold together, it makes atmospheric pressure and creates a wind. Now, I propose to you today, there's still lots of fuel to be burnt because there's lots of sinners that don't know Jesus. There's still lots of oxygen, no spirit to go around, isn't there? It sure is. What we need is the wind to drive it. Holy Ghost wind. It mentions in the text that we read there this morning, and that when Pentecost came, there was a sound of a rushing, mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. That's Acts chapter 2 and verse 3. And when I was in high school, they made me read a book, Who Has Seen the Wind? No, we can't see the wind. It's invisible. But I tell you, you can sure see and feel its effects. You know when there's a breeze or a wind. Oh, my, if we get the fire and the wind, together, it's a force to be reckoned with. Oh, yeah. Holy Ghost wind and Holy Ghost fire equals supernatural power. Now get a hold of this. And this statement I'm about to make is the uh, impetus or the inspiration for the whole message. I'm just musing in thought, and this is a common uh, saying. It's not enough for you to possess the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost has got to possess you. Now, can I make that statement again? It's not enough to possess the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost must possess you. Has anyone ever seen someone that you think is possessed of the devil? You know it. Why? Or how, how do you know it? Because they're driven by an evil spirit that seems to have a hold of them. Well, if we know when someone is possessed of the devil, we ought to know when someone's possessed of the Holy Ghost. Now, there's a difference between being possessed with the devil and being possessed with the Holy Ghost. Or said, the devil, he drives and he's brutal, he's forceful. But the Holy Ghost is gentle, he leads and he guides. Right? Either way, we should know when someone is either full of the devil or full of the Holy Ghost. All right. The difference between being driven and led. The spirit is subject to the prophet. Let's talk about the Holy Ghost. Right? He's gentle. You've got a decision to make. Do I do this? Do I not? Have you ever heard the expression, oh, the devil made me do it? <laughs> a lot of times that's just an excuse for you to do the works of the flesh. And you blame the devil for it. It wasn't the devil at all. It was just you. All right. 
most cases, spirit subject to the prophet, unless it is a demon possession where that you're being driven. In the kingdom of God, where it's a Holy Spirit, it's gentle and kind, and he won't force you to do something you don't want to do. Now, Pentecost is known to be different. Clear back in the beginning, book of Acts, Antioch, they were first called Christians. Christians was known as little Christ. It was meant to be a slur. It was persecution. It was not something that was said to be nice. And now today, if you would say I was a little Christ, I'd take that as a compliment. All right? Christian, it's a compliment. Uh, Pentecostals have been called cults uh, for no reason at all. I mean, if you've seen the definition of a cult, we certainly do not qualify that, and I'm glad we don't. But what's happening is people will say things and use con phrases or blurbs. What are they doing? They're expressing displeasure at you and trying to persecute you for the way that you live. I've heard people say that Pentecostal people are weird and they're spooky. Matter of fact, if you get anywhere near them, they'll cast a spell on you. I mean, uh, they're crazy. They hang from the chandeliers and they roll on the floors and they talk in tongues and all kinds of things. And there's two extremes. They either live like God or the devil. They're either real godly or they're super hypocrites. And because of it, it seems like Pentecostals have a stigma. They're hated. But I look into the scripture and Jesus said in John chapter 15, verses 18 and 19, he told his disciples, if the world hate me, it's going to hate you. Right? right? We're different than the world. And that's why we are hated. Why do people make statements and slurs and things and try to persecute those who are living right? It's because your very presence causes conviction. Your very presence causes conviction. Wow, it makes other people feel uncomfortable. Now, we're living in a day and age where Pentecost has reached a status quo that our ways have become acceptable. We're not persecuted as much, and neither is the fire spreading like wildfire. Why no more persecution? In the opening uh, verses of the book of Acts, it shows us that the Lord uh, had in mind to launch a movement that would be known as Pentecost and further on as Christianity. The opening day of this movement, there were 3,000 120 that received a personal Pentecost. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the evidence. Amen. Now on their second gathering occasion, over 5,000 were added to that number. I mean, this is happening very quickly. It's spreading. And then history. Just let me just interject some history here, not, not Bible, but history. History and scholars said that within six months of the beginning of Pentecost that there were over 100,000 new Christians in the city of Jerusalem. Wow, that's spreading pretty fast, isn't it? Yeah. Pentecost, in its early stages, spread like wildfire. Now, the reality of that today, everyone sitting here or who professes to be a Christian can trace their faith Back to a moment or a movement that began in Acts chapter 2. The magnitude of what happened through this group of people raises the question, what was it about them that caused them to be so mightily used by God and spread so quickly? Because after all, this little group of people were just nobodies. Nobody knew their names. They were just numbers. And where did they come from? Nobody seemed to know. Yet history records that they were used by God and literally, quote unquote, turned their world upside down. Yeah, yeah Acts chapter 17 and 6. These that have turned the world upside down. That statement was made by a king and ruler. He said, we threaten you. And we commanded you not to speak or to teach in the name of Jesus. And you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Yes, yes. Wow, Acts chapter 4 verse 18 and verse 20. And then in, verse five, in chapter 5 verse 28 and 29. 
how that it expanded and filled Jerusalem at the command not to teach or to preach in that name. I'm telling you, something happened that caused it to spread and spread quickly. Persecution seemed to be an awesome motivator. It was supposed to put the fire out, but it was adding fuel to the fire. Wow, I like that, don't you? Fuel to the fire. Persecution wasn't a retardant or a deterrent to the spread of the gospel. So persecution worked as a different kind of fuel, and my, did it work. If we look closely in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, excuse me, that should have been 2, that's a typo here on my behalf, 2, chapters 1 through 14, there's at least four things that we can see there that can cause them to turn their known world upside down. Now what I want to propose today, instead of turn the world upside down, it's already upside down, let's turn it right side up. Hallelujah. The early church had a faith that produced obedience. We need to get a hold of that. A faith that produced obedience. They trusted God. I mean, they served God with all of their heart, mind, soul, and strength. If God said it, they did it. There was no holding back. There was no unbelief. There was no disobedience and no hesitations just do what God says obedience is like fuel to the fire yeah now you cannot separate your faith from obedience before Jesus ascended on high he told them what to do wow he did what he told them what to do nobody going to tell me what to do Huh? He told them what to do. And he said, I want you to go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father in an upper room. He said, I want you to be my witness. It's going to happen in Jerusalem. I already told you they filled Jerusalem within a matter of six months. <laughs> Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. He said, I, I'm telling you, go back to Jerusalem. And this is where the movement is going to Begin, wait there in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. This was the promise of the Father that we're told about in Luke chapter 24 and verse 49. And then over in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. Now, when Jesus, just before he told them what to do. Do you have any idea what happened in Jerusalem just 40 days before this? 40 days prior to Jesus' ascension. Forty days prior to the outpouring of Pentecost, Jerusalem was not a safe place for a Christian to live. It was there in Jerusalem. They whipped Jesus. They beat him. They tried him. They crucified him. They buried him. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus, Jerusalem's not a good place to live. But Jesus told them, you go back to Jerusalem. Well, they didn't hesitate. They didn't disobey. They were not deterred. They had a faith that produced obedience, asking no questions. So they went back to Jerusalem. They did what the Lord told them to do because they knew it was the Lord that said so. They heard his voice, and when he speaks, we just do it. Now you remember Paul a little bit later on in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 11 he had in mind he was going to leave one of his missionary journeys and go back to Jerusalem to uh, observe Passover there. He got in one spot and there was a prophet there that grabbed a hold of him by his feet and said, Yea, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> Bonds, afflictions, and death await you in Jerusalem. Paul looked at Agabus and said, Yeah, I've had that witness in every city. Right? You're not the only one that said that to me. It's not like I'm on a suicide mission, but I do want to do the will of God, and I feel I need to go to Jerusalem. Supposing I die there. Wow, that's a quite a faith that produces obedience. The Bible is clear that your faith ought to produce disobedience, or ought to produce obedience. If you're disobedient to your faith, it's contradiction in terms. Wow. Now everything that the Lord desires to do with you or through you, he does as a result over what is being done inside of you. 
Amen. And the Holy Ghost is supposed to produce a faith that causes obedience. So this uh, spirit that's on the inside of us that is used to spread the gospel like wildfire, be it in your hometown, next town, or I don't know, it's part of the earth. It's not the training that you've got that's the most important thing. It's not your education. It's not even your experience nor your passion, but it is your love for the Lord Jesus Christ and the relationship that has grown since then. So everything that Jesus desires with you and through you is done over what is being done on the inside of you. And I'm telling you, that spirit that he's placed on the inside of you will give you faith that produces obedience. That's, the early church had that, a faith that produced obedience. Number two, they had a passion, and that passion produced a unity. Verse 14 says they were all with one accord and in one mind. That one mind there in verse 14 literally means they were of one will, one heart, and one passion. Now, this morning when we gave some pastoral admonitions, that was to bring us together in unity and harmony, if there should be any disunity at all. Right? We've got to work together in unity and harmony. This early church had a passion to work together, regardless of some of their individual differences. We're going to work together. Matter of fact, they even sold a lot of things and had all things common. I'm not promoting that today, but what I'm trying to say here is that they had a passion that produced a unity. Now, that unity was to do one thing, and it's told to us in Acts 1 and 13, it was to uh, spread the kingdom of God. In Acts 1 and 3, he presented himself alive with, with uh, many infallible proofs, and he appeared to them in the next 40 days. That's 114, okay? Jesus, when he appeared to them, making known to them he's alive, in the next 40 days, every opportunity that he had, he schooled, he discipled, he instructed his disciples about the kingdom. The kingdom. That's what's important, the kingdom. Which leads me to a sub-topic under this one that I'm talking about, passion that produces unity. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is the ultimate, eternal, redemptive plan and mission of God. That's hard to remember. Why don't we put that in plain English for you? I'll go to the Bible to get it, okay? Tim, I'm sorry I didn't get this one in the scriptures there, but it's Romans chapter 14 and verse 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what the kingdom of God is. It's in the Lord's eternal redemptive purposes to see that everybody receives this experience and is ready to go to heaven. That's the kingdom of God. Now, the church is used to promote the kingdom of God. Amen. All right, so we know what the kingdom of God is. And Jesus uses the church and to uh, talk about the king and the kingdom. The people in the book of Acts wrapped their heart around the kingdom. They were united in mind, heart, spirit, and purpose. They knew that they were saved to serve. Wow, saved to serve. Oh, that's different, isn't it? We've heard that, but we're saved to sit. No, we're saved to serve, right? The church should have a passion to witness and to send forth those who will witness. Missions is an active part of the church. Yeah. So what's fueling the fire thus far? We've got obedience. We've got persecution. We've got missions. What next will fuel the fire? Well, Part number three, the early church had a desperation that produced prayer. A desperation that produced prayer. Today, there's not enough desperation. They devoted themselves to prayer. And they didn't stop until God showed up and did what he said he was going to do. This may seem a little bit humorous to you but I, I just got to confess okay seven to ten days how many would have been that committed to stay there 
and pray seven to ten days until it happened. Huh? Not desperate enough? Well, honestly, I can't sit still in a tree stand for 15 minutes to wait for a deer. Hello. We are not desperate enough to put in the time that it needs for the Lord to do what he says he's going to do. Now, having said that, our God is sovereign, and he chooses to limit himself to the prayers of his people. He can do anything he wants to do, but he won't do it until he's given a reason to by your prayers. Anybody hear about powerful praying? I want to change that paradigm. It's not your prayer that's powerful. It's our God that we pray to who's powerful. Hallelujah. <laughs> but we've got to pray to put him in action. Yeah. Oh, Lord, we need in Pentecost a desperation. Amen. That causes us to pray until something happens. You want it bad enough, you can have it. God really doesn't need us. He doesn't need our prayers. And it's not our prayers that's powerful, but it is God himself that's all powerful. And he will move when God's people are moved to pray. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. So prayer is not what's powerful. And I've heard about people talk about being in powerful prayer meetings and powerful this, powerful that. Hey, we got it just a little bit wrong there. It's our God that's powerful. Amen. It's the desperation that's needed on our part. Prayer will put us into contact with the one who has the power. Now, anywhere in the world, be it a home missions church or the churches that Paul established on his three missionaries' journeys, anywhere where an active work of God was started and continued, it happened with a group of people that were gathered together in prayer until it happened. Mm. So we limit God when we cease to pray. And when we cease to pray, unbelief sets in. And when unbelief sets in, we don't obey when our faith is supposed to be full of obedience. Number four, the early church had a spirit that produced power. Mm. Now, what really happened on the day of Pentecost? Once you think about that, what really happened on the day of Pentecost? Well, I suppose that would depend on the religious persuasion of the one that's going to answer that question. There are difference and diversity of opinions as to what happened on the day of Pentecost. And I shake my head. Why is there differences and diversity of opinion over what happened on Pentecost when you can read it in black and white? There doesn't have to be difference of opinion. <laughs> Come on. It says there plainly what happened. There doesn't need to be a diversity of opinion. So regardless of what the opinion was, I know all denominations who claim to be Christian, they do agree that something did happen on the day of Pentecost that produced an empower like never before. It was supernatural power. It was the result of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. It was the endowment of power from on high that was talked about in Luke chapter 2, 24 and 49. It was the promise of the Father. It was the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues of the Spirit of God gave the others. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. This supernatural power, the Holy Ghost, did a tremendous work, and it was catching fire real fast. It was working through vessels that were willing and obedient. It was working through people who had a passion to work together in unity. It was happening with people that were desperate and praying, giving God a reason to move. Now, it's the difference between a buck saw and a chainsaw. Or the difference between a hammer and an air nailer. If you have ever been in contact with power tools... You'll never be happy with hand tools again. 
<laughs> oh, glory. Supernatural power versus natural graces and human ability. You know what we need in Pentecost today? It's a fresh outpouring of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, that's exactly what we need. In the book of Acts, the church was an unstoppable force. The church was powerful, and it spread like wildfire. It wasn't somebody's clever planning. It wasn't a new program. It wasn't even a social event. It wasn't new technology, and it wasn't the music. It was the moving of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. I said it was the moving of the Holy Ghost. That's what made it spread like wildfire. I know we sing the song, we're used to, oh Lord, send the power just now, or oh Lord, send the fire just now. Baptize everyone. Threats couldn't stop it, riots couldn't stop it, torture couldn't stop it, nor any other type of persecution. That was just fuel to the fire. Oh my. Fueling of the fire, you've got obedience, you got persecution, you got missions work, and you got supernatural power. Now that's quite a combination for wildfire. Yeah, it is. What we need is that combination. These group of men in the early church and women that started out was a very unlikely group, just small. Nobody knew their names or actually where they're from, but they certainly had the faith that produced obedience. They had the passion that produced unity. They had the desperation that put them to prayer. And they had the spirit of the living God that produced supernatural power. Oh, if we had this today, I believe the kingdom would still be increasing at a very quick rate instead of slow pace. And I close with saying this this morning. Oh, Lord, we need the faith and the power personally, and then to be able to send men and women forth into a world that needs Jesus. Our message is still the same message, amen, and it still needs to be spreading like wildfire. And so I close with this question. Are you fuel for the fire or a retardant? What's a retardant? Something that stops the fire. I want to be fuel for the fire. Oh, Lord, send the fire just now. Praise God. Let's stand this morning. Hallelujah, Jesus. We need you more than we've ever needed you before. Lord, our faith today.